we're uh, finishing up on chapter 23, and we're going to look at uh, some more examples uh, as we finish this chapter about this subject that we've been looking at all different aspects of about illicit relationships, illicit mixtures, uh, which I hope has been illuminating uh, in that uh, I think that is a uh, not, not well understood section about these illicit mixtures. I'm hoping that we're making it more clear what its purpose is, why God does these things. Uh, and uh, of course, even as we've gone, even to the New Testament, looked at some of the applications of the New Testament. So let me pray quickly for us to start. Uh, Lord, we just uh, pray for your guidance and wisdom tonight as we go through this book, uh, this really remarkable book uh, of Deuteronomy, where, where your, your servant Moses explains and applies the law more clearly. Uh, kind of a summation of it, a clarity of it. So give us your mind uh, as we go through this and see how it applies. We pray for both understanding and application of it. Pray these things in, uh, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we, we finished verses 1 through 8, um, and we're going to take 9 through the end of the chapter tonight. So let's read 9 through 14 first. That's the first section here. It says, when you go out as an army against your enemies, then you shall keep yourself from everything, uh, from every evil thing. If there is among you any man who is unclean because of a nocturnal emission, then he must go outside the camp and he may not re-enter the camp. But it shall be when evening approaches, he shall bathe himself with water, and at sundown he may re-enter the camp. You shall also have a place outside the camp and go out there, and you shall have a spade among your tools. And it shall be when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it, and you shall turn and cover up your own excrement. Since the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to defeat your enemies before you. Therefore, your camp must be holy, and he must not see anything indecent among you, lest he turn away from you. Now, you cannot say that the Bible avoids almost every imaginable topic of human experience. Yes. It does not. And therefore, uh, I think anyone who... Uh, you know, shies away from the issues of the body, bodily functions, human sexuality, certainly is not apparently reading Deuteronomy. <laughs> because it, it doesn't shy away from these issues, does it? So starting in verse 9, as, uh, you know, as opposed to the first eight verses, the topic swishes, switches, and you have to understand that the camp he's talking about here primarily as a military camp, okay? It's what Israel is to a great extent at this point, and it's certainly what it's going to continue to be even more so in the next few years, because after Moses is taken from the earth, Joshua is the leader, and then what comes next? The conquest. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're ramping up for all these elements of getting ready for the contest. Now, the Lord is seen here as the warrior king. We have an example of this not very far away here. Why don't you turn to Joshua chapter 5. And here's an ideal example, I think, of the Lord as warrior king. This is as they're preparing to have a, a victory over Jericho as they come into the land. So starting in verse 13, Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for your, our adversaries? And he said, No, rather, I'm indeed now 
come as captain of the host of the Lord. Captain is probably not a great interpretation. Actually, something on the order of five-star general would be probably a better description uh, and, and really translation of this. And he says, and Joshua fell upon his face on the earth and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Now notice what the Lord, that is, this is the pre-incarnate Christ, who is the, the leader of the Lord's host, remember? The Lord's host, the Tasaba army, the angelic host. He says, and the, and the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So it's very clear that who is who he's seeing here and who he's interacting with here is not just some powerful guy, but rather, well, what's the other verse that reminds us of this? <clears throat> Exodus chapter 3. At the burning bush, Moses comes, sees this bush that burns but never is burned up, okay? And the, what's the, he told him? Take off your sandals for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. So this is the same idea. This is this being in the unique presence of the infinite personal God right in this situation. So this is what we're talking about in this camp, that, that God is there. His presence is there. Now, it says in this camp that, one, that they're to reflect on and to respect his holy nature. That's the whole point of this. And it says in, in the verse, keep yourself from every evil thing. So they're to act in a way in which they show consummate respect for the Lord as their king warrior leader. Now, the first thing that's mentioned, the first issue that's mentioned here is dealing with this, quote, nocturnal emission. That is an inadvertent flow of semen from the male at nighttime. Now, the rule here is that if it occurs that this soldier, this individual must leave the camp, he must stay outside the camp until <coughs> evening, he must then wash himself, okay, at sundown, and then at the time of sundown, which is that time between the end of the mm -hmm. previous day and the beginning of the next day, remember that that's the way the Jewish day worked, then it, at that point he's allowed to go back into the camp. Now, the point is not that he sinned. There's no evidence that there's any sin involved here. That's not really the point at all. The problem is, and the issue I believe, is that the nocturnal emission represents the fact that it doesn't accomplish a God-ordained purpose, that is, procreation. Mm -hmm. The purpose of, obviously, his ability to eject semen is in marriage with his wife, and in that process, there's a complete or wholeness of what occurs, leading potentially and likely to procreation, the development of having children. This is the proper context, and therefore, it, it's an incomplete thing. That's the problem with it. It's incomplete, okay? So there's also a parallel to this, and I, I'm not going to go to all the verses on it, but there are also parallel verses about women and about menstruation, and that they also are in, in a menstrual period where they obviously, uh, you know, uh, have not had a child. They also are, you know, they have to cleanse themselves. Ovulate. You know, yes, they have to cleanse themselves, and of course, uh, because there, were, again, was an incompleteness in that the egg was never fertilized, mm -hmm. and therefore a child is not uh, is not coming from this. So they have to go through this ceremonial cleansing. Now, I think it's interesting that water here is used as a means and a symbol of cleansing and purifying. And it's interesting, I think, to think to go back to one of the first places that we ever mentioned. The first mention of water, actually, is, of course, in the first few verses of Genesis 1. The creation is made from this massive ball of water, okay? But then there's a next mention, a second mention of it, 
and that would be Noah's flood. But I think there's an interesting connection here. You might want to keep your place here and turn over all the way to First Peter, way to the right in your Bible. And we're going to go to chapter 3 of First Peter. And we're going to look at verses 20 and 21. It says, who once, he's talking about the, uh, the spirits who are now in prison. That, that, in other words, the, it's, we're, we're talking about these fallen angel entities that came down to the earth. We know Genesis 4, Genesis uh, 6, 4, 5, about they create these offspring called Nephilim, the giants, okay? And it says, it says that who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now notice the connection he makes here in verse 21. And corresponding to that, that is the cleansing of the earth from that evil, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal for God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here's a typological element that we see here in Deuteronomy 23 that has many applications to it, even to the baptism of Jesus by John, okay? And all the way to the very end where he's talking about, you know, there's going to be a, a consummate baptism uh, that's going to occur uh, in, in that way. So, now, there's also uh, another issue that comes up here in, the, in this verse, back to Deuteronomy 23, and that is, uh, uh, it's verses uh, 12 and 13, you shall also have a place outside the camp and go out there and you shall have a spade among your tools and you shall, it's when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and shall turn and cover up your excrement. Now, there's an issue, not only of respect here, but of course also of hygiene. In other words, people are directed uh, in a way in which they should go outside the camp, not in the camp, obviously, uh, and of course, dig in an area and then cover their excrement. Obviously, that keeps from disease occurring. You know, uh, I, I've been I've mentioned to you several times that I've been seven times in the past to Honduras, and uh, the people of Honduras have very few concepts of hygiene. In many of the, the small towns that we, we've gone to in years past, uh, nobody owns a, a, a bar of soap. Nobody has a concept in that sense of washing their hands. And one of the things that is uh, appalling, I guess is the best way to put it, is that you come into these small villages where all these people have diseases. And many of them, some missionary group has come and sunk a well and has a wellhead there. So they have, actually have a place, therefore, to get clean water which is a huge issue because if they don't, they're constantly going to have parasites and be sick all the time, which is exactly their problem. But almost inevitably, when you go there and you see what's going on, you see two things. Number one, all kinds of animals are all around the wellhead and obviously defecating right around the wellhead. So they have no concept of keeping them away from the wellhead. Then in multiple villages, you know, I was amazed to see that they built some outhouses, but these outhouses were probably no more, at most, more than 50 feet from the wellhead. So here's this effort that somebody put in sinking a well for clean water, and yet their own practices are such, they're constantly even contaminating the wellhead water. So again, they continue to be sick. It's really sad. 
but you know. It I, has to be complex education, like, you know. Yeah, as a matter of fact, one, one of the things that we did one year is we had several villages that uh, we had through this one hotel in <laughs> Copan Ruinas, where we stayed usually for several days, uh, we were able to purchase uh, fairly large amounts of soap. So one of the projects we had is to go out to these villages and teach people how to use soap. That almost sounds incredible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what we really needed to do. So and then you yeah. said you would leave and then you come a year later and you deal with the same problem. Yes. So what I'm trying to say is this has to be you know, salt and complex. I mean, you need to educate their own people. Yes. To to you know, service all this. Thing. It is true, and it's and it's difficult to do. It's difficult for villagers that many of whom have may, maybe maybe a second or third educate grade education mm -hmm. to teach them these things about how they need to handle all these areas in terms of their own hygiene. Now, I think it's interesting also that not only does are, are, are the people to do this, to show respect and relationship to the Lord, but also I think it's interesting today that we have this issue, that defecation is really a very personal issue. And even to this day, we make certain special rooms for it. Obviously in our homes, it's a bathroom and very few people don't have a door on their bathroom, all right? You would, it would be almost appalling not to have a door, wouldn't it? Okay? And at the same time, even in public places, we have these special public bathrooms and we set up special stalls. So obviously, even today, we know that there's something unique about the privacy side of this issue of defecation and excrement and the, and the removal of it. Now, it's interesting in verse 14, here's kind of the real reason here behind all of this. Since the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to defeat your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy and he must not see anything indecent among you lest he turn from you. See, this is the real reason. So he walks in the midst of the camp. And that's, in other words, he is all seeing and also uh, it, it indicates that that he walks the land now in ancient uh in ancient israel and also in, in ancient other cultures in the middle east landowners regularly did this as an act of a symbol of their own possession of their own property they would go out and walk it now we probably have an equivalent of this more so maybe let's say in the west the west united states where we have these very large tracts of land mm -hmm. of these very large herds of cattle mm -hmm. and of course what does everyone do and i'll guarantee you they do it i've seen it plenty of times as we've traveled out there they walk their fence line walk their fences, yeah. right because they have to make certain of the condition of their fence line do repair of their fence line so they're constantly walking their property in this way well of course in that case they're probably riding their property but it's the same kind of principle they're overseeing the perimeter and the extent of, of that property which they own trying to take care of it now verses 15 and 16 we move on to an, another issue here so let's read 15 and 16. you shall not hand over to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall live with you in your midst in the place which he shall choose in one of your towns where it pleases him. You shall not mistreat him. Now what is going on here is that this is uh, where uh, the, the issue of the slave who's a foreign slave, a runaway slave, okay? who has come into the area of Israel. Now, it's interesting that, the, that in the ancient world, these slaves had virtually no rights whatsoever. They were bought, they were kept 
until they died. There was no chance of escape. There was no chance of really redeeming themselves in any way. And certainly there was no, usually no code of conduct in their nations mm -hmm. and cruelty and mistreatment was the, was the daily experience of these slaves. So if they somehow were able to get away from their master and enter into the territory of Israel, they had asylum. Israel gave them asylum, okay? Now, it's interesting that Israel, and some people have criticized this as they read the Bible. Matter of fact, there's a lot of liberals who have criticized this. Israel did not ban slavery, especially in the area of payment for debt. We have many passages in the Old Testament where you could and you can indenture yourself for the payment of a debt. Mm -hmm. But of course, we know there are several, there are many limiting factors. One of those limiting factors is you could only do it for six years because in the seventh year, you had to be let go. So at a maximum, you could serve six years. Plus, there are many passages in the Torah that talk about how you treat your slave. A slave could be redeemed. He could buy himself back if he was able to do that. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of different, you know, passages in the Torah and codes in which how you had to treat the slave. So, you know, I often see liberal commentators talking about, you know, what a terrible thing that Israel endorsed slavery. But really, it was very conditional in Israel. They had many terms to it, many conditions to it. Slaves had many rights in the process of their of their indentured servitude or slavery. And the master could not do anything he wanted. Matter of fact, if he was particularly cruel, lopped off an ear out of anger or something like that, then immediately the slave, the slave had to be set free. Mm. So right, if cruelty was occurred, then he gained his freedom right away. Now, I think it's interesting, even though people, of course, there's the hot topic in today's culture about white privilege okay racial inequity and of course with this thing that's being taught increasingly in universities and schools which if it continues will be the greatest disaster probably that's ever occurred in education in this country which is critical race theory here is the belief that it's white people and white privilege that's caused all of the problems of quote colored whether that's Hispanic, apparently, or African-American, or whatever peoples. And therefore, the apparently, in their view, it's only through the elimination of white privilege that, and well, some of them are saying through the elimination of white people, actually, too, that they ever gain social justice and equity. But think about it. If... Let's go to the beginning of this. The plantationist system started in the colonies in this country, but moved quickly into a plantation system that was predominantly in the southern area of this country. Mm -hmm. An agricultural system occurred in plantations all through the south, and slaves were used as economic labor for the slave owner okay, to obviously work these plantations. Isn't it interesting that so many people in the South were supposedly, and I believe they were, Bible-believing people. Certainly the South has always been, had a strong tradition toward Christianity, but apparently very few of them ever read the Torah and saw the limitations of what slavery should ever be. Think if they had applied the limitations of the Torah and all its codes about slavery, Think how differently slavery would have occurred in the South. We would have never had slavery over generations in the South. We would never have cruelty of masters over, you know, et cetera. So it's, it's really interesting how the code of the Torah would have actually, if it were applied, would have eliminated these things. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I think there's also a strongly typological issue here, and that is that there's a typology that applies to the New Testament. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. Hold your place and hear 
in Deuteronomy, but turn over all the way in the New Testament to Colossians. Past Romans, past Corinthians, and Galatians, and Ephesians. Nope, now I just went a little too far. To Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. Here's Paul's statement about our status as members of the New Testament church. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Do you see the image here? Mm -hmm. Who were we enslaved to? Satan. Satan. Whose kingdom were we a part of before we were saved? Satan's. Okay. What enslaved us perpetually in his kingdom? Sin. And it's only through our salvation that we're freed from the slavery to the world, the slavery to the slave master, and given an opportunity to live, of course, in God's own kingdom. We can see the same thing. Go back to Romans chapter 6. Go to your left just a little bit. And Paul says it's another way in Romans 6, verses 16 through 18. He says, do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, pretty clear image here, the slave owner, the taskmaster, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So I think this image is all through the New Testament about the slave owner in a, in a way to gain freedom. In this case, it's specifically targeted in, Cha in Deuteronomy 23, the foreign slave, okay? So now let's move on. Let's go to verses 17 and 18 and read those and discuss it. None of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute, nor shall any of the sons of Israel be a cult prostitute. You shall not bring the hire of a harlot or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God for any votive offering. For both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. Now, we've got to look at some Hebrew words and Hebrew concepts here to make this a little bit more clear. It's a somewhat complex wordplay in the Hebrew. Obviously, uh, there is a uh, prohibition against, quote, a cult prostitute. The word here is Kadesh Ha, Kadesh Ha. That's the Hebrew word for the cult female prostitute. Interestingly, though, the word in Hebrew means a holy woman or priestess. It doesn't imply directly prostitution. But remember, in Judaism, women were never priests. Therefore, this word was idiomatic for Jews that it was a cult prostitute because it had to do with paganism. Mm -hmm. It obviously didn't have to do with Judaism. Mm -hmm. Now, so it always had a derogatory meaning. Female priestesses inevitably were priestesses of the worship of a false god or false gods mm -hmm in the religious systems of the Canaanite peoples and the peoples around Israel. These women were almost always engaged in these illicit unions, back to the illicit mixture concept. And of course, this illicit mixture was prostitution, obviously, for payment. Now, cult priestesses also 
were mediums, okay? And they normally performed ritual sex magic, which were enchantments or spells that again, they did for money. These were rites that were performed by them. Also, they regularly performed sexual reenactment of a demigod being born. That is, the female pro as priestess prostitute would therefore have sex relations with the male priest prostitute, obviously, who you know wore some kind of garb that indicated that he was a demigod. And through the process of their sexual relationship, it would imply the birth of a new demigod. They would act this out on a regular basis. Now, this, this also occur, this also occurred vice versa. That is, it also occurred with a male priest who therefore would perform sex with a female cult prostitute who was dressed up as a female goddess, again, for the idea of a new uh, demigod being born. Now, it's interesting that the cult prostitute priest, that is the male, in Hebrew, his word, the Hebrew word for him is Caleb. And notice what it says. It says, you shall not bring the hire of a harlot or the wages of a dog. That's the word, Caleb. So the male priest prostitute in Hebrew was called a dog. Okay. Uh, there probably were other uh, implications going along with that about the behavior of a dog probably especially a female dog also. So the cultic priest or priestess prostitutes also, of course, made money for the pagan temples. They paid for the upkeep of those pagan temples for the, quote, salary of the priest or priestesses in those temples. Therefore, the application in these verses is any monies that would be made by a Jew who had fallen into cultic pagan practice and made money through the process of the prostitution act in it would be absolutely forbidden to ever take that money and to pay a votive offering or a tithe in the house of the Lord. Because what does it say? Okay. It says your, uh, that the Lord, your God, uh, will not accept this for any votive offering for both of these are an abomination to the Lord. So the God is in no way honored by these acts and the money earned by them. So it's absolutely forbidden that this occur. So you follow me so far? All right. Now it's interesting that we have examples of this going on, but one thing that I think we might turn to to see Jesus' words in this principle I think is found in Luke 20. I'm going to read it to you. Luke chapter 20. And I'm going to read you verse 25. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things are God's. In other words, don't corrupt Caesar's money, Caesar's taxation, or any process or means by which that taxation occurs. Don't confuse it with the things of God. The things of God and the money you give to God or the purposes of God should be very different. Okay? Now, also, we see examples of violations of these very things occurring all through the Old Testament. Let me show you a couple of them. Turn first from Deuteronomy 23 to 1 Kings 14. First Kings chapter 14. It seems almost as quickly as God made these injunctions it was no time at all before people violated them. And here's an, here's an example of it. 1 Kings 14, verses 23 
and 24. This is speaking about Rehoboam, who, of course, when, when the north and the south split, there was a king of the north and a king of the south. Well, Rehoboam was one of those kings. Solomon's son. Yeah, son of Solomon, right. Now, go down to um, verses 20, verse, starting verse 23. For they also built for themselves high places and secret pillars and ashram, that is the component part of, there's Baal and the male component and the ashram, the female component, on every hill and beneath every luxurant tree, verse 24, and there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations, which the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. So as fast as God dispossessed these cultic nations and ridded them, starting with the conquest, the people would fall back into cultic practice and do the very thing that he warned them not to do. Let me show you another example. Go to 2 Kings 23 from 1 Kings. So 2 Kings chapter 23. And we're going to look at verses 4 through 7. Notice the litany of horrific things that they do in these, just in these three or four verses. Okay? This is about uh, that uh, it's a reform talking about from of King Josiah. But it's talking about what he has to reform when he comes into power, what he has to get rid of. He says, then the king commanded uh, Hilkiah, the high priest and the priest of the second order and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple and the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and the Asherah and for all the host of heaven. Now, you know what that refers to? Astrology. The host of heaven means all of the cult practices that are involved in their use of ecology. Uh, of astrology to obviously predict, to worship the planets, which really means they were worshiping the demigods. That's really what they're worshiping. Okay. Uh, uh, and he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of, of the Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. And he did away with the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had appointed to burn incest in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the surrounding area of Jerusalem, also those who burn incense to Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the constellations, and to all the host of heaven. Do you see how corruptly they were involved in astrology and the worship of the demigods? It was horrific at this point. And he brought out the Asherah, and the, to the, uh, uh, from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem to the book of, brook of Kidron and burned it in the, in the book, brook Kidron and, the ground, and ground it to dust and threw it and its dust on the graves of the common people. And he broke down the house of the male cult prostitutes. Obviously, their temples were built right there, okay, which were in the, in the house of the Lord where the women were weaving hangings for the Asherah. So these people were practicing an unbelievable level of cultism of every imaginable kind right there in Israel. And, jo and Josiah, of course, enacts a reform of these things. It's also interesting to turn, and you don't have to if you don't want to, but I'm gonna go past Daniel to Hosea chapter four. It's, a, again, another example of an indictment by Hosea of what was being practiced in the land. Here's Hosea's description of what he saw, okay? Starting in verse 11 of chapter 4. Harlotry, wine and new wine take away the understanding. My people consult their wooden idol, and their diviner's wand reforms them. And the spirit of harlotry has led them astray. And they have played the harlot, departing from their God. They offer sacrifices on the tops of the mountains, 
That would be where the Baal images and the Asherah images are. And burn, in, uh, burn incense on the hills under oak and poplar and terebinth trees, obviously, which they carved usually to make Asherah, because, they, uh, because their shade is pleasant. Therefore, your daughters play the harlot, and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the harlot, or your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go apart with the harlots and offer sacrifices with the temple prostitutes. So the people without understanding are ruined. This is the condition of what was going on in Israel during Hosea's time. Again, another indictment of how quickly they departed from the teachings of the Torah. Now, back to Deuteronomy 23, and we're moving towards the end of this chapter. Let's read verses 19 and 20 and take another section here. Deuteronomy 23, 19 and 20. You shall not charge interest to your countrymen, interest on money, food, or anything that may be loaned at interest. You may charge interest to a foreigner, but to your countrymen you shall not charge interest, so that the Lord your God may bless you and all that you undertake in the land which you're about to enter and to possess. So, here we have the issue of lending money. The rule was that poor Jews were to be protected by very many, actually, aspects and codes in the Torah, and uh, many sections of the Torah, from economic exploitation by richer ones. This is the whole point. Poor Jews could not be exploited by richer Jews <clears throat> through the process of lending money. They were in, the richer Jews in many sections of the Torah were encouraged to lend money to the poor, but they could not charge interest, okay? Uh, therefore, the loan had to be free of interest. It talks about they loan money to their brothers who were financially in trouble. Money, food, produce could be, could be loaned, but prohibited to charge interest. You don't have to turn here, but it's the first place this is noted in the Torah is in Exodus 22, verse 25. Another place where this is talked about, this might be worth looking at, actually, is Leviticus 25. Go to Leviticus 25. We'll read this. Starting in verse 35 of Leviticus 25. Now, in a case a countryman of yours becomes poor and his means with regard to you falter, then you are to sustain him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. Do you see the point? The, the more well-off had an obligation to help those less well-off. Verse 36, do not take usurious interest from him, that is financial interest, charging interest, but revere, but revere your God that your countrymen may live with you. You shall not give him your silver at interest, nor your food for gain. So here's what is taught in the Torah about this. Now it's interesting that charging interest, we have lots of examples of this in the, the different writings and uh, different clay tablets of Mesopotamia talking about how other cultures charge interest. In many of these countries, silver was loaned out at a 25% interest rate and food and grain was loaned out at 50% interest rates. Now think about it. If you already don't have enough grain, and you don't have, don't have enough food, and you're recharging a 50% interest rate, it's driving you into poverty deeper and deeper very rapidly at 50% interest rates. This is the very thing that is taught in the Torah that the Jews are not to do. 
It's like throwing the poor man into the prison because he couldn't pay his Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, we, and certainly in Amos, we studied that. So therefore, if they charge interest, the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. Now, I think we have to ask ourselves a question, and I have some information I'd like to share with you. So do we as a culture do any better? No. no. And that's the question. So, I, I went through two different articles. One of them is by, in Forbes magazine. The other is Wall Street Journal. And I pulled out some relatively recent data uh, 2019-2020 data about the condition economically in this country. The first article is entitled, think about this title, how the top 1% savings buried the middle class in debt. And you think, how could their savings do that? Well, listen to this. The top 1% that is, it's defined by those making 500000 to $10 million per year, accumulate large amounts of capital through their earnings. This, of course, is loaned out and put into investments. Okay, for, uh, for instance, uh, prior to the 2008-2009 collapse, a pool of this money totaling $70 trillion accumulated by the top 1% was loaned out in investments and, of course, was lent as mortgages to unqualified people. Yeah. What was the result? The mortgage collapse of 2008-2009. This is the money, to a great extent, that was used to cause this. Now, the top 1% uh, include 20 million uh, U.S. Million, uh, millionaires. The top 1% include in our country 20 million U.S. millionaires. That is 40% of the global total of millionaires. And also in the U.S., we have 28% of the world's billionaires. Thus, a capital glut is used by these individuals for investment purposes and put into investment vehicles of the rich, okay, that fund both household and government debt. Now, it's interesting that the top 1%, for instance, hold 50% of all stock holdings in this country, the top 1%. Corporations' net income after paying dividends and some investment uh, elements into capital investment, their own factories, et cetera, uh, increasingly are, uh, over the years are going to finance debt instruments through investing it in auto loans, credit cards, and home mortgages in this country. Corporations and their, uh, and their accumulated uh, earnings between 1985 and 2014, these corporations cut labor and capital costs by well over 7%, and these corporate profits grew uh, increasingly each year by almost 13%. It, it was found that $600 billion uh, less dollars went to worker salaries workers' benefit, and workers' insurance programs, which led to $1.2 trillion more towards corporate pro product profits. So what were, have corporations been doing over the last especially 15 and more years? They've been cutting their expenses, paying their high-paying you know, uh, managers lots of bonuses, cutting the amount of money they spend on salaries, and also on bonuses for their average workers and making horrendous profits as a result. It's been found that since 1999, family income has barely increased adjusted for inflation. Think about that. 
over the last 21 years, almost 22 years, family income adjusted for inflation has barely increased. But costs of things, from the cost of cars, to the costs of groceries, to the cost of college education, have increased in many cases, the cost of, cost of housing, many cases have increased well over 100, 150% during that time. Think about that. Salaries have hardly gone up adjusted for inflation, but college tuition, cars, and other things like that have increased by 150%. That's why when Biden says he's gonna tax the rich to pay for all this stuff, it's insane because they bury it. Right, that's true. And of course, it'll never happen also. Mm -hmm. Thus, the bottom 90% increase debt by, by households and have increased debt by households from 1983 to, through 2015 by more than 40%. As I said, income has been stagnant for almost two decades. Consumer debt has increased recently by $4 trillion, which is the highest ever recorded in this country. Student loan debt has gone up to $1.5 trillion. Auto debt has increased 40% in the last decade and is increased to well over $1.4 trillion. The average auto loan of new cars has increased consistently over the last 10 years, with new cars averaging now well over $34,000 average for a new car. This with people on incomes that have not appreciably gone up, okay? Since, since mortgage rate interests have remained low because of the work of the Federal Reserve to push rates down, this has encouraged the middle class into even more debt to stay up with their former standard of living. On top of this, COVID restrictions and shutdowns over the past year or so have caused massive loss of salaries, jobs, 40% they say of smaller businesses have closed because of COVID restrictions. And of course, it's vastly increased government debt through business loans, through unemployment programs, and through stipends to each tax taxpayer. The point is that as the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And of course, it makes a very interesting point that we can read in the book of Proverbs. I will go there and read this verse to you. It's Proverbs 22. I just went a little too far. Twenty-two. And it's verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. How much more true could that be? The middle class in this country is shrinking mm -hmm. dramatically. It's estimated that since 2008, 2009, the middle class has shrunk by 40% in this country. And the only way that most of them are keeping up with their standard of living is to increase debt. We now have many, many, many people that are making six-figure incomes in many different parts of this country, over $100,000 and more, that cannot afford to buy a house. You go to the West Coast, you go to California, you go to the East Coast, because why? If they have to put 10 or 20 percent down on a home that probably is going to cost them four or five hundred thousand hmm, dollars, they can't do it. Probably more than that. They can't do it. So the rich are really enslaving the poor in this country. The large corporations are enslaving people in this country. You know? So I don't think we're doing a whole lot better than what was going on in Israel during these days. Okay, so let's finish this chapter up.
Let's read verses 21 through 23, back to Deuteronomy 23. I got to get back there myself. Okay. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it be a sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it from you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be a sin in you. You shall be careful to perform what goes out from your, from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. Now, this is this interesting question about making vows. It's interesting that laws concerning vows to the Lord were never mandatory in the Torah. Never. As a matter of fact, they were discouraged. Turn to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs 20. I'm back to finding Proverbs again. Come on, get past on here. So Proverbs 20, and we're going to look at verse 25. It is a snare for a man to say rashly, it is holy, and after the vows to make inquiry. So again, you see, they're discouraged from making vows because they need to be careful about the vow they make because they must perform it. Turn to your right from Proverbs to Ecclesiastes, just a few pages, to chapter 5. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 and 5. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. Look at verse 5. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. So, making a vow was a serious thing, but you had no obligation to make it. And actually, you were warned, probably prudent not to make it, actually. Now, we see an example of misplaced vow in the book of Judges. We studied it in the past. But I want to mention it again. Turn to Judges 11. Back to your right. Pass Joshua, Judges chapter 11. And it's the story about Jephthah. He was one of the judges of Israel, starting in verse 30 of Judges 11. You'll probably remember this because we we taught this. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If thou will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them. And the Lord gave them into his hand, and he struck them. And, of course, drop, you, you can drop down then to, um, uh, let's go to verse 36, okay? I'm sorry, verse 35. And it came about when he saw her, because now who comes through his door when he comes home? His daughter. His daughter. And it came about when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have wrought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me. For I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. Well, of course, she didn't create the problem. He created the problem. So she said to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord, so do to me as you have done since the Lord has avenged you of your enemies and the sons of Ammon. And, of course, what we believe, as some people interpret this, that he offered her as a burnt offering. I went through that when we studied Judges. 
And I think that's not the proper interpretation. And I went through that with you and showed you that what he what he really did is he vowed her into a permanent virginity. She could, uh, and so she goes in two months and weeps with her fellow uh, virgins about the fact she'll never marry. And that's apparently what really happened, that that was the vow. So this is an example of a foolish vow. <clears throat> now it's interesting Jesus has words about this also. I'm going to turn to Matthew 5. This is his wisdom about it. Matthew 5. And we're going to read verses 33 through 37. And again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. Where do you suppose that verse comes from? Yeah. Deuteronomy 23, okay? But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by earth, for it's the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no, and anything beyond this is evil. Now, one of the reasons why the ancients would make vows is they would make them for a couple reasons. One, because in making a vow, they believed they could induce the Lord to do what they were asking, okay? Rather than simply having a faithful prayer, they somehow felt that they had to make some tremendous vow to get God to act. Mm -hmm. We know that that's a false understanding. Secondly, they also would make vows to try to convince another person of their sincerity or of their intention, okay? Like, for instance, loaning money. Instead of simply being honest and having a history of integrity, they would make these elaborate vows. For instance, they would say something like, by God's holy temple, I will surely repay you this money. Okay? So they're using this vow to induce someone to do something for them. Now, back to Deuteronomy 23, and let's finish tonight. Tim? Yes? A uh, question. Where people make a vow in court or, or to be sworn in as, as a president or whatever, they put their hand on the Bible and they they swear to do something. Would that really come under the sort of thing we're talking about? Yeah, here? it is a vow. Absolutely. Matter of fact, one of the one of the ways in which you could call a vow, if you were breaking it in a sense, was self perjury. That would be a way to put it. Uh, actually, it's a violation of the third commandment. Okay. Well, in our society, we do it all the time yeah. in the legal yes. sense. Yes, but we're required in that sense to make a vow in a court. And of course, the way we fulfill the vow is to be honest. Right. We tell the truth, we fulfill the vow. Okay, so we're not, we haven't perjured ourselves. Mm -hmm. True. Okay, so let's read verses 24 and 25 and we'll finish tonight. <laughs> when you enter your neighbor's vineyard, then you may eat grapes until you're fully satisfied. We shall not put it, any of them into a basket. When you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you shall pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. Now, the purpose of this was humanitarian concern for travelers. Okay? In other words, in ancient Israel, since roads were not always connected between point A and point B, Frequently, people would have to travel relatively long distances through people's fields. Mm -hmm. So if they were a long distance and therefore had no sustenance, this allowed them to take, if it's a vineyard, grapes to eat, okay, or if in a grain field, grain to take the heads off of and chew for their own sustenance. The point was they couldn't put any in a basket and carry out of the field. They couldn't take a sickle and remove a bunch of grain and put in a basket 
to carry out in the field. If they did that, it was theft. Okay? So this was purely for their sustenance. Now, I think there's one interesting application of this, which we'll use to close tonight. And I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 7 about Jesus. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath to the grain fields. His disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of the grain and eat. Now, knowing what you now know, mm -hmm. is there any problem with this? Yeah, no. no. They're doing exactly what the law says they can do. They're walking through. They're traveling. Okay? It just so happens to be on the Sabbath, but they're hungry, and they simply pull some head of grain and eat it. Okay? But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Behold, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of the Lord, and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath, but are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, quote, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Now, they are doing something that is not wrong. The issue, interestingly, that the Pharisees have is not endorsing the idea that they had a right to take the grain and eat it while walking through the fields, but they pick a different issue. They never even comment on the Torah in Deuteronomy 23, but they say, no, this was a violation of Sabbath. And it's interesting, the point Jesus makes in verse 7. Their attitude is typified by his statement. It's actually a quote from Hosea 6.6. 6, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. In other words, they're taking their some portion of the Torah, twisting it to a rigid law, having no spirit of compassion behind it, and that's how they're condemning him and the Pharisees and, and, the, and his disciples. So it's interesting. They were allowed to do this because of what we just studied in Deuteronomy 23. So, all right. So we're done with 23. We're going to move on to 24 next week. And uh, Ann, would you close us in prayer tonight? Dear Lord Jesus, um, your word um, reflects and gives us so much information of how we're to live, and yet how that word has been so rejected, even from the time of the Jews to now. Yes. So Lord, we just pray that you will burn in our heart your word and show us exactly how you want us to live day by day. Mm. Lord, again, we lift up to you our brother Steve. Yes. And know that he's hurting at this time. Mm -hmm. Give him the wisdom and strength and courage to go one day at a time. Yes. Help him in every way needed. Mm -hmm. Help us as we go as and, 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 and um, Lord we just thank you for who you are mm -hmm. in your name.